but also they are organized and oriented in relation either to solar or to astronomical directions. Here again, there seem to be parallels to the monument of Yonaguni. It is the case that between nine and 10,000 years ago, uh, when it is extremely likely that Yonaguni was still exposed above water, Yonaguni Island itself was exactly on what was then the Tropic of Cancer, the ancient Tropic of Cancer. And this was an astronomically significant uh, location. The people who made this monument may have been interested in using it for directional bearing or because of some type of astronomical significance. Near the monument, there is a stone which we call sunstone. Now, I'm not sure if it was used as a sun dial or for some religious purpose, but the long hand of the stone does point to the north and south. Could it be that the monument of Yonaguni is the birthplace of the Atlantean legends, flood myths, and shared knowledge of the past? Or is it simply a collection of rocks and a collection of coincidences? The mainstream scientific community is inclined to believe the latter. Archaeologists and, and historians regard themselves, rightly, as the specialists in our culture on the past. They do like to feel that they know everything that needs to be known about the past. And so the idea of a very major forgotten episode is uh, a bit threatening, I think. And when a very interesting phenomenon like the underwater structures of Yonaguni is found, instead of rationally and intelligently investigating that phenomenon and coming to conclusions, most academics just write it off at the outset and don't even want to know. There are instances, however, where academia has explored the mythical places of the past and found them to be real. In 1870, German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann excavates a network of ruins near Hisserlich, Turkey, and discovers that the mythical city of Troy is a real place. More recently, in 1992, Earth imaging radar helps to unearth the mythical city of Ubar, which according to Islamic legend was destroyed by God and swallowed up by the desert. If similar scientific efforts are made at Yonaguni, could there be a similar result? Our archaeology is present, is at present uh, a rather uh, crippled and limited thing if it focuses its attention only on evidence from above water. We have to look at the areas where human beings lived before they were flooded. So I think what the Yonaguni Monument is telling us, uh, and in a very in-your-face kind of way, is that there may be a large part of the human record of the story of human civilization which is presently withheld from archaeology because it's underwater. When we continue, geologist Dr. Robert Schock makes his first underwater dive at the Yonaguni Monument and makes an unexpected discovery. It was very beautiful, it was very interesting, but it was nothing like the photographs I had seen. Yonaguni is not the first underwater monument to claim a connection to the lost civilization of ancient legend and lore. In the 1960s, Amateur archaeologists tout this rock formation in the Caribbean as the Bimini Road, a man-made highway to Atlantis. Geologists insist it is fractured beach rock. And in the 1980s, Russian divers claim they have discovered structures of Atlantean proportions off the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic, but still have yet to produce photographs from that expedition. Is Yonaguni just another Bimini Road? Or is it the smoking gun? In 1997, Dr. Robert Schock arrives on Yonaguni Island. He is the first Western academic to dive the monument, perhaps because he prides himself on working both inside and outside the mainstream. I think of myself as coming from a very traditional background. I've got a PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale. Um, been doing a lot of very traditional academic work. But in 1989, 1990, I first got involved with the Great Sphinx of Egypt. Traditionally, the Sphinx is dated to 2500 BC. By my dating, looking at erosional 
um, patterns on the rocks, the amount of uh, erosion, the nature of the weathering, doing some uh, fairly sophisticated seismic studies, etc., I've come to conclude that the oldest portion of the Sphinx is at least 5,000 BC. So I was already used to looking at sort of, um, should we say, unconventional things. Certain people, I think, as a compliment, refer to me as an open-minded scientist. I take that as a positive. Um, so I was not someone that was going over there should we say, dogmatically skeptical that this could never be the case. I was open to the possibility that here in Japan we had a very ancient structure. Almost immediately, however, Dr. Schock notes something that will be a harbinger of discoveries to come. I went right down to the coastline and you could see very dramatically the waves tearing at the rock and breaking it off and actually forming this step-like structure. On his first dive, Dr. Shock is escorted to the site of the Yonaguni Monument by Hihachiro Aratake, who discovered the site in 1987. They dive with writers John Anthony West and Graham Hancock. As they approach the monument through a narrow passageway, each has his own impressions. On each side of the passageway, we see two courses of megaliths piled on top of each other, and the joints between the megaliths are at, at exactly the same level on both sides of the passageway, completely roofed over uh, with uh, flat blocks, rather of the, the same shape as the classic goalposts of Stonehenge. What I see is rock that seems to have fallen naturally. In some cases, harder rock may be sliding down softer rock and naturally working its way together as it collapsed on itself, forming a wall-like structure. Through the passageway, the first view of the monument is the stunning megaliths dubbed the Twin Towers. This is one of the, one of the many factors that, that convinces me that we're looking at a, at a man-made structure here because I find it very difficult to imagine how nature could have contrived to lower those two megalithic, rather neatly shaped blocks uh, into position side by side, just four inches apart. I found a lot of natural vertical fractures and it started making sense to me how this beautiful structure, an incredibly regular structure, could in large part, potentially be the result of natural processes. Shock finds the same natural processes at work on the monument proper. The way the beds are formed, the natural rock layers are formed, they flake off nice and horizontally, they're crisscrossed with nice vertical fractures and joints, they weather and they erode such that I believe you get nice step-like structures there will be what looks like an absolutely perfectly clear-cut, perfect horizontal, perfect vertical, but when you stick your mask down next to the corner, you see that it hasn't been cut, but it, rather that a chunk of rock has been wrenched out of the, away from its natural fault lines to produce this extraordinary formation. However, based on his own dives at the site, Professor Kimura questions the erosion theory. At the bottom of the monument, there are no rocks. If this were a natural creation, 